Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to re return and talk with the, with the Coupa Conference. Uh, we've done this a number of times, and it's, uh, it's always a pleasure to work with, them, with a, a group of individuals that really is a cross-section of what it's all about in not only using ammonia, but also regulating it and responding to it. And it centers around the concept we call the one plan, where we bring it all together and try a, a, in a coordinated way to address the challenges. So today, I'll take you through the process of the one plan with a focus on how to address, how to prepare to address, and then to address the first 30 minutes of an ammonia emergency. And I'm going to focus today on ammonia refrigeration because it's one of the most difficult and challenging uses of ammonia. Uh, we, we, we figure you can master industrial refrigeration, you can handle the rest fairly easily because the, the concepts of use of ammonia beyond uh, industrial refrigeration actually get simpler to, to manage. Just a quick background on myself. I was a fire chief in, in the Santa Cruz area in Watsonville for 20 years, uh, 33 years of experience in the in the fire service, and, then, and uh, while in Watsonville, I uh, joined together with Doug Hill, who, uh, who was the CEO and president of Hill Brothers Chemical, and together we formed the Ammonia Safety and Training Institute. It's a nonprofit that brought together ideas from both public safety and industry and regulators, and we, uh, we work from 1987 to today, still actively working on on trying to create the best methodologies, the best practices, and, and, and uh, managing ammonia and ammonia emergencies. Um, also have with me today Ernest Brown. Uh, Ernest, as you will see a little later, we have a, um, a model uh, plan, a one plan pro process going on right here in Brea. Um, it's an AmeriCold cold storage facility. Um, uh, Ernest is a engineer and a safety specialist uh, safety is his, uh, his passion, and he's helped us uh, actually create the AmeriCold plan, and he's working with ASTI to take the message forward and work on, on taking it into other industries across the country. Uh, so it's a, he's a welcome addition, and as we get into the, the, the discussion about AmeriCold and what we did there, Ernest is available to answer questions from the industrial side. Just real quickly, how many of you are from industry? Oh, cool. And then uh, public safety of uh, fire. Okay. And then regulate regulators, locals, coupas. Cool. All right. That's the mixture. Uh, anybody that didn't raise their hand and wants to speak out and I missed the category, let me know what that would be. <laughs> Consulting. All right. Good. We, they need you out there to help pass the word. All righty. So the... The you know discussion about ammonia is it's a very popular chemical. Um, and actually, refrigeration is a very small part of, the, of its use. Most of it's in agriculture. Ammonia has been credited for for actually saving many starving people because without ammonia, you wouldn't have fertilizer. Without fertilizer, the, the production, the food production, would be way down. Uh, it's also good for you know helping the environment. It's been used to not only in, in sanitizing and, and you know dealing with uh, uh, drinking water, but the air, the air pollution. It's injected into fuel stacks to reduce the amount of NOx entering the atmosphere. Ammonia is a good chemical. Uh, the 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 popularity of ammonia is going up. Um, with the Montreal Protocols, um, Greenpeace actually uh, called it the refrigerant of choice. Because it's one of uh, the natural refrigerants. And uh, this slide comes from a good friend of mine that just passed away this last year, Anders Lindborg. And I have a few of his slides in here um, because they're good. And then, then it's, a, it's a memory for me and, and using his materials because he's very proud of that. Because he was an international soul. He was the prince of ammonia na internationally, all over the world. And he promoted the idea of ammonia as a, as a good chemical that could replace chemicals that are not as good. And um, ammonia is a very efficient, uh, uh, it doesn't take as much power to, to use ammonia as a refrigerant. And plus, when it's released to the atmosphere, it breaks into nitrogen and hydrogen. It doesn't have the carbon. And, and of course, that, that's, a, that's a big challenge. So why is it great that ammonia stinks? Right? It stinks. You've, since you were a kid, you remember why your mom mopping the floors with the ammonia? You've been around it. If you ever, you know, played football and you got the smelling salts, you've been around it. But why is it good that it stinks? It's a warning sign. 
exactly. It's a warning sign. And, uh, you know, that's, most problems start off small. And most problems can be smelled, especially by the nose that has not been burned out from standing in the odor of ammonia for any time. You know, after you get into it for 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes, the olfactory fatigue comes in. You don't even know it's there as much. You get used to it. A fresh nose walks in that has, still has some sensing mechanisms left in it because it's been taken care of, picks it up right at like five parts per million. So your nose picks it up, it tells you then there's something going on, and the challenge then is to do something about that, right? To fix the problem. Uh, that's where we're heading. So, you know, we got ranges here, and the, and the range from, so the range from zero, from five to 50, that's, that's where your, your sensory mechanisms are gonna pick it up. You know, and you're really gonna smell it at, at, at 50. And then you get from 50 to 300, 300 being the immediately dangerous to life and health, that's where it's uncomfortable. <coughs> uncomfortable to the degree that you will, uh, you, you will not want to stay in it, but, but your likeliness of surviving without significant injury, if the exposure is 30 minutes or less, is very good. So it's still in the warning range at 300. Then 300 to 700, now it's getting irritating. Now it's starting to be very difficult, you know, as you're, as you're getting into the higher levels. From 700 to 1700, the, be, the beginning of some potential damage begins to occur. At, at 1700 to 5000, now you're, you're facing fatal uh, doses of ammonia. Uh, so you can see all the way from where you smell it to where you're looking at, at a high risk of, of fatal injury is a big buffer zone. Now, there's a, there's a, uh, the regulatory numbers, the, the AGLES, the acute exposure guidelines from EPA, that's what emergency responders use. That's what they use to judge circumstances. When they're looking at, can I, do I have a person down, for example, in an atmosphere of ammonia, fell off a ladder, there's a leak going on, and there's, there's 2,000 parts per million of ammonia, and he's been in there for five minutes. Is that a viable rescue? If you look at the Eagles, you can see the 10-minute exposure at 2,700 parts per million, potentially viable. Can that firefighter go inside that room with turnouts and breathing apparatus to rescue somebody in vapor at 2,000 parts per million? That's training and comfort levels, but yes, it can be done. We do it. We work with it, but it's something that needs to be trained into the system. What happens if that level goes up to 5,000 parts per million? The likeliness, this is the beginning of Eagle 3. At 5,000 parts per million, the likeliness of survival after five or 10 minutes is, is next to nothing. So we, you know, we, the monitoring system, the levels, the time of exposure tells you that. What about another uh, situation? What if you were judging the downwind threats and you needed to know whether to move people to evacuation points or to keep them sheltered in place? And let's say that the levels were 110 parts per million in the room. Some of it got inside. Before we could shut the ventilation systems down, we took in some ammonia. And the people are experiencing 110 parts per million. And it looks like they're going to be in there for at least 30 minutes to 45 minutes. We can look at the eagle, and we can see the 60-minute values. You can see they're not even at eagle 2. They're safer inside than to move them out inside the, into the vapor cloud. That's what, uh, you know, getting to know the, 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 the product, the hazards, and then tuning that back to your emergency plan. That's what this one plan logic is all about. We have done the evaluations, uh, I should say the Chemical Safety Board did the evaluations, and they came up with, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking at a five-year uh, uh, review of, of incidents that happen in refrigeration, because they get a lot of them. It's a high volume uh, rate of, of, of calls, but the injury rates and the death rates are actually relatively low. But the circumstances, so they studied, rather than individual ones, they studied them as a group. And they found that valves and piping are your number one cern concerns. And you know, most all valve and piping issues start off with minor releases, minor problems. And then the employee is caught up in a situation where they may be um, addressing a situation in, whoops, wrong way. Uh, and the, this is, a, you know, the operator working on the system, and all of a sudden, you know, 
There's a crack in a line they're trying to tighten or loosen or ma manipulate the system. It opens up right in front of them and they're hit straight on with an aerosol cloud uh, with no gear on, with no protective equipment on because they're just simply doing a minor adjustment or they're checking something out. And so when they can't see and they can't breathe because they've been hit with this aerosol, they go down and based on their training and background, they may not ever you know, escape any further than that. That's where most of the deaths have occurred with regards to the uh, workers related to ammonia. The only public death we had was a heart related problem during a, a, uh, an actual escape and it was the stresses of the emergency event more than the ammonia that caused that. We have three zones of concern. Starts with the IDLH in the, in the hot zone, right? 300 parts per million in the hot zone, that's where the risk factor is high. And generally, in a, in, a, in a system where you have it contained, that, that's going to be in the room. Clear the room. Pretty easy to do if you're not the victim right in front of it. Pretty easy to get out of the way of an ammonia release. You go out the door, you close the doors, the release is contained to the room. Now you go to the system, and the system will then control the problem. And then you ventilate the gases. When you ventilate the gases, you have an isolation zone. The Department of Transportation set for the first 30 minutes, they set numbers. The initial isolation zone for ammonia is what? Does anybody know it offhand? Very good. From an industry player, we got 100 feet. Small release, 100 feet. Large release, how far does it go when you have a large release? 500 feet. 100 to 500. Muscle memory. He's been through the training. It's in his plan. 100 to 500 feet, and they mark it out on all, uh, all their facilities. Mark it out and, and designate that small and large release area. That's where the life hazard is the, is the, the most important to, to initiate in that first 30 minutes. Beyond that, you have the protective action zone. In the daytime for ammonia, the protective action zone on the downwind, pressing you a little bit now, what's, what's the number on that? Point 0.5. Miles, half mile. At nighttime, though, 1.3 miles. Why does it get worse at night than the day? The dew point, the cool temperatures, the lack of wind. Wind in and of itself, a good wind, will reduce that protective action zone by half because wind dissipates the ammonia. So when we learn these facts and we apply it to our plan, and we have the muscle memory to put this in effect, we define our zones, we know what life safety really means. And we, we use that in, in our protocols. So uh, just to kind of give you a little comparison, the, the, the death rate after looking from 95 to 2004, this is with the Chemical Safety Board, they came up a total of 22 de uh, deaths over, excuse me, over the uh, all industrial facilities, I should say, all industrial users of ammonia, there was 22 deaths, 11 in refrigeration. So there was a 2.2 per year annual rate of, in general and 1.1 for ammonia. Now, if you look at carbon monoxide in, um, in, the, in the average over, the, this was a longer period of time, but we took the annual average and it was uh, 88 per year. If you take nitrogen, it was 7.3 a year. So you can see that some of the gases that you don't smell, that you don't get warning on, that all of a sudden you kind of fade off into sleep or you fade off an inability to breathe like nitrogen poisoning will do, death then comes a little differently. Whereas ammonia is in your face. It's, you know, I, I portray it as you know, a hard-working sailor that, uh, that does a great job, you know, from everything that I described earlier, you know, being a fertilizer to a refrigerant and all the other things in between. But when you let it loose, that sailor is looking to get a drink. What's the drink? He loves water, and he's going after it, and he's going to be fighting mad for it, and he's going to be in your face, and he's going to tell you all about it. And what do you do about it? You close the door, and you send him to the brig. You know, you put him off in his room, and you cool him down. You just cool him down, and, you know, and he gets easier to manage. The more pressure you take off of him, he settles back down to a nice guy. 
And when he's a nice guy, you can isolate him and control him. And basically, that's the story about ammonia in a general sense, but I'm going to show you the specifics in a minute about how to accomplish that, how to get that to that, that next phase. Also, there's a high level of injuries that, that follow along with the same uh, information that I gave you earlier about why we have deaths. Is there's so many, so many situations where the workers are caught right next to the release, and we haven't got it into culture yet to where that PPE during the time they're doing maintenance, service, odor investigation, the things that, you know, that, that we know these problems occur. <clears throat> Any old salts from the fire safety, from the fire world here would identify with this. I started in 1970 in this, with the city of Davis. The fire chief at the time smoked a cigar. He stood in the doorway and he says, as long as I can stay in the doorway, you don't need that breathing apparatus. Just go ahead and hug the nozzle and, you know, if you got to puke, that's part of life. That's what it's like being a firefighter. Well, he died at heart, with heart disease at what, about 52, and, and we were, the United States had the worst, uh, the worst record on death and losses than any other industrialized country in the world because we weren't paying attention to the, you know, to the facts. We were being too macho. We had a culture of leather lungs, right? That was supposedly the, the toughness of being in the profession. But we changed that. With America burning, a federal act. The federal act came along and they said, it's unacceptable to have these levels of losses. And so we had training. We have PPE. We have fire prevention. We have mitigation, sprinklers, and smoke detectors. The world came alive with answers. And now we're, you know, we cut the death rate and the injury rate in half. And now we're, we're back where we belong. We're leading the way in, in reducing a life loss and, and injury. Because we engaged the mitigations, we engaged the training and the common sense, and we changed our culture. Today, if you see a firefighter, even on a dumpster fire or a car fire or an outside fire, without a breathing apparatus on, the shame is going on that, that person and the, and the discipline as well, because it's not acceptable anymore. That's what we need to get into the industry. All of us need to get behind us and move it and get that culture changed. And then those rates are going to come down significantly. It's a cycle of safety. You know, it's, and, the, and the better we do this, the better we get at it. The, the bottom line is prevent them all or stop them small. That's, that's what ASTI was born on with regards to the logic. Prevent them first and foremost. Mitigate them. Listen to the engineers. Work on the answers. Stop them when they're small, even from your standpoint of your response protocols, because that's your best chance. And it happens in the first 30 minutes. You know, take this golden time and maximize your use. React quickly, but react smartly and engage. And it comes with engaging p the, the PMP, as you can see over here in the, in the process as we go around. Make sure that you have the right personal protective equipment that goes with an SOP for using it, that we have the, the layout of, the, of, of how we're going to approach it, and then use your response plan, the one plan logic to engage and stop the problem when it's small. The better you do this, the, the stronger the circle of safety is, the less that one's going to get away in that first 30 minutes. You'll stop them small. Or they won't even happen at all. Not a lot of glory in this, like firefighting. They, you, know, the, you, know, they, you know, the suppression guys, they always used to tell the prevention guys, name one good fire that you, that you put out. <laughs> well, of course, it never happened. <laughs> But they could name a bunch of them that they responded to. Well, that, that's turning around now with regards to our process. We don't, we don't need to go there. And that's where PSM came from, right? If it wasn't for the fact that ammonia has some dangers or risks associated, would PSM or even be here? If, it, if we were really doing refrigeration and all the processes with water, would we need PSM? No. But my challenge back to you is how much of this great process is really turned back into emergency planning and emergency response. I know your goal is to have that, but how much of it is actually used during an emergency? How much of that PHA or the, or the PNIDs and, and a lot of the details that you work so hard to create actually gets pulled back in and used, especially in that first 30 minutes? Not enough. It does get used, but not enough. And that's what the one plan logic was. How do we bring that into the game plan so that we can maximize what we need to do to engage at that level. And so to do that, let's take a quick, you're going to get a class on this. Don Trackathon's uh, uh, president of the 
Refrigerating Engineers and Technicians Association on Thursday. I think he's going to be, are you going to be in this room, Don? Come back Thursday because you're going to get a, a great presentation on refrigeration. But I'm just going to give you a little bit about refrigeration, how it relates to emergency plan. Now, the first thought about refrigeration is it's heat management, right? It's actually taking the heat that, that this product that you're bringing into this cold room uh, is going to give off and then it's in the evaporator coils that, that when, the when the liquid ammonia evaporates into a vapor, it's ab absorbing that heat. And so when it comes out of this room, it comes in a liquid, comes out of vapor and goes into the mechanical room, the engine room. You know, the area where your, uh, where your compressors are. And the compressors are going to take that vapor and then they're going to turn it back into high pressure vapor that goes up on the roof where the condenser is located. The condenser on the roof, you see them steaming a lot, right? When you drive by sometimes, you see steam coming off of them, and if you listen, there's fans going. Well, what's doing is taking that hot gas that just came from the compressor, and it's letting the heat go to the atmosphere. Letting the heat go to the atmosphere. So that high pressure vapor that came, uh, that's ammonia, what's it turn into when it cools it down? Liquid. Right? Now liquid falls back into the receiver and then the cycle starts over again. So you, you, it's the switch with evaporation to absorb the, the heat and the condensation that lets the heat go to the atmosphere. So the heat that came in is the heat that goes out. So in that process, how do we manage it? Well, just to kind of give you a quick diagram, we have, you know, the, the, the process has got a low side and the low side is you know, looks kind of like this in the, in the cold rooms where you got these evaporator, you know, see the fans up there? And that's where the ammonia is making the transition and it's absorbing the heat out of the room. Um, and then it goes to the high side, to the, to the engine room. And these are the compressors where it's taking that, that gas back in and it's going to make it a high pressure gas. And then it's going to go uh, from, from the compressors, it's going to go up to the uh, condenser on the roof and this is where you see that you know the the vapor coming out of the top of these because it's cooling that down it comes in as a high pressure gas comes out as a liquid and then it goes from there it drops into the receiver um, and in the receiver it's, it's stored there and eventually with processing they take the vapor off and they cool it down and they cool it down and it gets sent back out to the evaporator um, there's a stopping point, a potential stopping point, we, we call the king valve, where the king valve is the liquid shutoff valve from the receiver out to the rest of the system. You shut the king valve off and you stop the flow. Now many times on the simple version of doing emergency control, it's thought about, well, let's shut the king valve off. That solves all the problems. Well, Don jumps up and down as an engineer himself when, I, when he hears anybody say that because it doesn't necessarily stop all the problems. It's just one part to the puzzle. There might be a time when the king valve needs to be closed, but a lot of times those compressors, if you leave them on, are taking all that vapor. And if we stop the heat flow, shut off the pumps, shut off the fans uh, at the, that take the heat in, so we don't create any new pressure and use the compressor to take all that vapor back and put it to liquid in a safe storage location, we can drop the pressure on old sal ammonium. What did I say earlier about dropping the pressure on it? What's he do? When you take that, that pressure off of them and you cool them down. Let's say we can bring them, we can set the suction pressure to zero and bring his temperature down to minus 28 degrees. What's old sal ammonia doing then? He's asleep. He's settled down. He's now a liquid, very stable. If I had this cup of water or this cup full of ammonia and it was t minus 28 degrees, would, would you be smelling it right now? No, it would look like water. What if I threw it out on the floor? You'd jump, wouldn't you? <laughs> Because then that heat and it would evaporate and all of a sudden it's not minus 28 anymore. Now it's absorbing all the heat when I threw it out there and it flashes off and it's a cloud. It's a vapor. It fills the room. But as I got it in the vessel, I put them in the brig and I cooled them down and I took his pressure off of them. It's very manageable. 
There's engineers that are telling me today that if we master this process in the emergency shutdown, where we take that vapor pressure down and get, to, get it to zero, Don was helping us with this the other day. In 10 minutes, we can take a system that's out of control and bring it down into something that's settled down because we can take that pressure off. the. If we can shut off the heat flow that causes it to want to go to that process and just use the, the compressors only to bring the vapor pressure down, we can do that. That's the goal of, of operating ourselves in the first 30 minutes out of harm's way. And so just to show you on the, the last leg of the loop, when it comes out to... Um, there's an expansion valve that meters the liquid ammonia into the evaporator that's doing all the work that you saw earlier. All that warm air that comes off the product goes to the ceiling, the fans draw it across the coils, the ammonia absorbs the heat, flashes off, evaporates the vapor, goes to the compressor, and the temperature in the room goes down. Now we stop that heat movement, and now we, we, we then, you know, an emergency action, and now we use the compressors just to settle old sal ammonia down so he's not a problem. That's one of our strategies. That's one of our options. And that's why when we, when we work with ammonia, we've got to learn to, uh, you know, how to use the system to get out of harm's way. So, you know, as I said earlier, you got a leak. This is, this is one of Anders' uh, visuals. You know, you got a vapor leak. If we can bring the pressure down and stop that vapor leak, the problem goes away. And a lot of that is by putting the ammonia to sleep. We also have manual pressure relief devices, diffusers that can do it, equalizers, uh, methods of venting vapor when it gets exceedingly high, like relief valves. And I'll tell you that the, the story on these diffusers, though, is nobody ever uses them. <laughs> you know, they walk away, they shut them, they, you know, they, there's an emergency shutdown button. Sometimes that gets shut off. And sometimes, is that the smartest thing to do? You know, if, you, if you've got a situation where you don't have flammability issues and you've got your emergency exhaust fans off, even though if you have a leak, but you're staying ahead of it, bending the vapor, would you want to necessarily shut everything down? No, we want to take the pressure off. We want to use the tools. We want the mechanic that knows the operator, knows what's doing, to use his emergency action plan to use the system to bring the threat levels down. And we want to diagram that out so that he's ready to do it. The liquid leak, this is the worst. The aerosol that would blow off in a liquid leak and cause an aerosol dense gas cloud, high pressure. This is one of those times where if it's the, you know, if you have the compressor involved with pumping out a release uh, immediately in the, uh, you know, off the thermal siphon or a, a part of the, the refrigeration system itself, that's when the compressor might be the best thing to shut that, that particular compressor down. But to bring the system down, you might use the other compressors to kind of actually address it or isolate, move the ammonia to a spot where it's safer and, um, and, and then bring it down. And that's where we have the isolation valves that can be remotely controlled and automated so that you can move the ammonia around and reduce the impact of the problem. When we get in situations where we have the, the releases, we can have a you know, the, I'm just going to, many times it's, you know, the releases are, are they start off, you know, rather small. They could have a, a, a gauge leak, for example, that, you know, that would come off and it would just start to, you know, put out an odor. They get stronger and stronger. And the idea is, can we get in here and actually uh, isolate that, that leak and then, you know, contain it to the area and then fix it? Well, unfortunately, many times small releases like this, when they go out and, and, and the smell of ammonia hits the air, many times there is a fear factor that comes along with that first whiff of ammonia, and everybody shuts down. They walk away. And we many times can't get an operator in on a small release and actually isolate it and, and, and fix it. Um, and then I'll show you a, a little bit about what you know the releases look like in a as they materialize um, the, the different phases of the release. You see, this is a aerosol release that, uh, that we just let loose. And you, that, immediate, that immediate aerosol, when it was, this is a quarter inch line, about, uh, what was it, about 80, 90 pounds, Don? Uh, and, and that aerosol release that really first came out there is going to be a lot of droplets of ammonia. 
Now, when the droplets of ammonia evaporate into the atmosphere, what happens to the temperature in this area? When as it evaporates and takes that heat that's in that area? It's going to get cold. Anybody have an idea how cold it can get in those aerosols? Minus 80. Minus 80 degrees. You're caught into a, a big, dense gas cloud like that. It, you know, the freezing factor is significant. And of course, it's 30, 40,000 parts per million, so that's way above our, our potential to, to, uh, you know, to breathe or to survive. The only thing you can do, as is, uh, just recently happened in a, with an experienced operator that happened to walk, he was shutting a system down, he walked over, and um, it turned out that, that, that pressure had built up on the condenser on a smaller system, a portable system, blew the whole end of the condenser off with 1,000 pounds of pressure, or a, thousand, a, big, a lot of pressure behind it. When it blew, it just sent 200, about 200 gallons of ammonia immediately flashed. And a dense gas cloud, uh, he hit the ground, he knocked him over with a concussion of the expression. He's, he sees it coming, and with split logic, muscle memory from his training, he realized that he had two choices on his escape. Which way would they be? If, you're, if it's coming over me this way and I'm on my back and I'm rolling over, which way am I going to go to get out of that release? Left or right? Lateral, right? I'm going that way or that way because the cloud's coming over the top. If I run downwind, I'm going to run with it. If I run upwind, I'm running into it. I'm going lateral, left or right. Quick glance, rolled over, took one breath on the ground that he still had a chance to get, closed his eyes and ran left and got out of that cloud. When he came out, he had frost all over his overalls, coming off his ball cap. His arms kind of went out like this as he ran because it, it, everything kind of stiffened up. His hands got really cold, but he survived. Does he have any respiratory injuries? None. He didn't take a breath. Does he have any injuries to his eyes? None. He closed them. It was his logic of survival. And he managed to physically get out of that cloud. And then he went to decon. The only challenge is when he went to decon, when they did do the decon, they didn't completely strip him. So the ammonia, when they washed, initially it was frozen to his arm. It took some skin off when he started taking his clothing off. They got water, flushed it got that off, started flushing, but they didn't take his pants off and they transported him and that ammonia went into his boots, into his feet, and he had significant third degree burns on the lower legs and feet. You gotta take all the clothing off and you gotta wash, wash, wash. 15 to 30 minutes of wash, wash, wash. Get in the shower, take, go to the emergency shower, wash, 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 get him into a regular shower with, with well, uh, comfortable water temperature, not hot, comfortable water temperature and let them stay in there longer. Wash all that ammonia away. And then the treatment would, you know, would have been a lot better because the upper torso wasn't burned bad. It was just the, the freeze burn. The lower was, was significant. So we, we learned these lessons and we passed them along. Now when, you, when that cloud hits those vehicles, you know, if you're in the vehicle and you shut the ventilation system down, that cloud's going to go right on through there. You might get a little bit of a whiff, but survival, if you stay inside, is really good. If you get out and try to run through that cloud, it's not a good story. So, you know, we know to, to take that step. Do, I want to talk about flammability. And, you know, one of the points about ammonia is, as the other refrigerants, they're all flammable to some degree. Um, and acetylene especially has got a wide flammable range. Ammonia's flammable range is about 16 to 25 percent. It's not a big window, but and as, as you can see, it's way up high on the scale on the amount of ammonia that it takes to burn. 16 to 25 percent. Anybody know how many parts per million that equates to? 160,000 to 250,000 parts per million. The simple rule on changing percentage to PPM is to add four zeros. And so it's 160,000 parts per minute. Now, if there's oil mixed in, like it's in the engine room and, they, and it's, uh, it's coming right off those compressors and there may be oil mixed in, 
that range could drop. Some say it could drop to 8%, which is 80,000 parts per million. Now, our rule of thumb in electrical planning as well as in emergency planning is that at one quarter of the lower flammable limit is when we're starting to be on guard for the flammability concern. So if you've got an engine room release, we train that at 20,000 parts per million, start preparing for the idea that somewhere in that cloud, if there's a source of ignition of 1,200 degrees or more, it could ignite. And when it ignites, it's just like a flashover in a, in a fire. It's like smoke when it, when it burns. It's got that kind of flash potential. It'll knock you down, it'll flash over, and then, then it'll be done. It doesn't have the concussion power that propane does. Propane, the curve on that is real high. It's, it, it hits hard and it's over. Ammonia burns for a little while. I've been through four fires while I was a fire chief in Watsonville with ammonia. And, uh, and one of the good stories about it is, is it vents, it goes in the thermal plume, it's never really been a problem. And if you've got a good operator, they're going to move that ammonia out of the harm's way and put it back in a receiver where it can be safely stowed and, and isolated from the rest of the release. That's why they got to be part of your team. Uh, this one was a, a circuit breaker box, a circuit breaker that had been giving that, uh, that company problems, and guess what they did? They, they didn't fix it, right? And that's what's happening with a lot of these things, is that you, you get the warning shots, you get the near misses, you get the situations where there's something wrong, and failure to act at that point materializes where all of a sudden you get an arc flash. This thing, when we got on the scene, was our, that's, that's one what, first engine on the scene. So we had a photographer with them when they pulled their first line. It was, you know, white arcing um, electrical. And then while I was there talking to the command team, asking them, you know, so what are we going to expect with the ammonia? And where's this fire going to go from the engine room to where? And we're trying to figure out a plan and dressing it. Then the, uh, then the main uh, power trans, uh, transformer started blowing and arc flashing. And so we had to, you know, utility company had to shut it down completely before we could even fight it. We put it out. I, I, I recognized that we didn't know what we were doing, and that's when Doug Hill and Don Tragathon and a number of others, we came together and said, hey, man, we, we can't do There's no standard out there that we can go to. We've got to start learning more about these processes and engaging. And um, this one was a, was a fire that was in a room that we didn't even know there was refrigeration until after the effect. And there's... There's, there it was, sitting in the middle of this packing shed. It was a, a arson fire that started. We, we stopped it at the firewall, but inside was ammonia. And the guys were working that fire. We didn't know it was there. That's where planning came in. That's where we started to recognize that we had to change our way. You know, small fires, this was a forklift fire that, that, uh, they, that, that forklift had been given a problem, started in the cold room. Once a fire starts in a cold room, cold rooms are designed to keep you know, they're, they're designed to keep air from the outside from coming in. They don't ventilate. You try to open the roof, do a trench cut on a cold store fire, and you're going to bog down your saws in, in you know, thick uh, insulation, and, a, and you just can't cut them. Because that's what firefighters do, is they vent the gases, and they can go after and put the fire out. Uh, this one was a uh, rooftop fire. This was started because of a failure in hot works permit. They did a hot patch on the roof, but they never went back and checked, and pretty soon it burned its way through, burned its way through, got a head start, got inside on the cold room, and they lost it. So fire prevention, is, you know, take advantage of those opportunities, the hot work permits, all the PSM stuff, it works, but engage it. Now, the, the greatest threat is in the first 30 minutes, but it's also your greatest potential for stopping the problem when it's small. And we, uh, we have the, what we developed was we call the pre-emergency readiness. And uh, with pre-emergency readiness, it's a checklist, it's a clipboard, and uh, by the way, this is all online, so you know how to get your materials. This, all the, the presentation as well as the plan is online, so you can, you can, you can uh, download this later. But we have what we call a, a, a command team for the, for the industrial sake. Comes with a plant IC, a lead responder who, who actually deals with controlling the ammonia. The plant IC oversees the overall uh, action plan for the, for the facility. An evacuation lead and a notification lead. That's your four main command team players. 
that, that, that you, you always want to have them on alert when you're doing odor investigation, line breaks, or high-risk maintenance. And furthermore, we encourage that the, that the operators wear their PPE while they're doing the line breaks, while they're doing the high-risk maintenance, while they're doing odor investigation, because the problems materialize then. And that we follow our checklist, the PSM stuff, that we actually engage that and utilize that so that, that we're ready to act should it occur. If it goes into an actual incident, the, the, the checklist goes into discovery, what we do in that first phase to get to initiate a life safety plan and give the alert and, uh, and start the ball rolling. We have three levels of concern that, that we like to get communicated right away. If it's a level one, it's incidental. It's a small release. It's just the gauge leak that we can handle ourselves. It's level two. We have a release. It's contained. It's in the room, but it's not controlled. So, you know, that's, a, that's another kind of a, a preparatory effort. Level three is out of control. It's going off, off site. It's getting away from us. It's our highest degree of concern. So if I got a call that came in and it said, it's a level two in the mechanical room or the machine room or the engine room, I got a picture. Yeah, he, they got a leak, but it's contained to that, to that room. Whereas if it's a level three, it's venting. It's going off site. It, it just puts another set of criteria into play. <clears throat> the idea of this whole process is to control, control the chaos. One of the things that, uh, that, w w that we've known for a long time is that when we come into, a, from an emergency responder standpoint, come into an uh, incident and there's people running all over the place, nobody in charge, uh, and you're trying to get a size up, trying to find out what's going on, where's the problem, what's happening, and there's no plan, then, then it's chaos. It kind of looks, chaos kind of looks like this. Okay, we have something just in um, to tell you about some live pictures coming to us um, from one of our affiliates, KSHB, there. Um, an ammonia leak at a Cook's Ham facility you in Kansas City has made at least two people sick. First of all, do you think that these folks had to come out of their warehouse, their working areas, and go outside into this vapor and then try to hold their breaths and walk and try to find their way out to safety? Did they really need to do that? Would it have been wiser to have safe refuge inside the facility where you have a secure safe refuge area or evacuate them out another route that they would go upwind and out of this kind of a, a situation? That's what the emergency plan needs to have in it, is the movement of people, because too often this is what we see, is the fire evacuation plan is the only plan, and for ammonia, it simply doesn't work. Moving people out to follow their evacuation order for fire is not like for ammonia. So you can clearly see they are quickly evacuating that facility there. Again, these are coming to us from one of our local affiliates in Kansas City. Emergency crews, including the Kansas City Police Department and an ambulance are on the scene to treat people who may have been affected by this ammonia leak. But you can see these workers are taking the warnings very seriously to get out of the building. We'll keep you posted. Now, is that, we also there's spoke the with friends commander. and families waiting to pick up workers. They stayed There's in touch a, with cell phones trying workers. to make sure that no do, one do they have a, plan? a wave of first shift workers flowed out of the building are, is, trying to get away from the ammonia. A hazmat team made its way in to help. It started Does around 2 o'clock this I mean, afternoon. There, but Kansas City, Missouri they Fire Office shut down the three leaking valves. Now, they're, once they're workers like were out, by. they kept moving they want us to, do? to steer clear of those fumes. Uh, come out, going a little further. You know, the ammonia got real stronger and stronger, so we was really, that's why everybody's moving out now towards the highway. So the 43-year-old who came in direct contact with it is being treated for burns on his face and his hands while up... What? What did they say? The operator was burned where? What was he doing? He was working next to the incident without PPE. The guy, the, the person that really knows what to do next is the victim. And therein lies the domino that first fell that triggered the other ones. And that's what we got to stop. It just, that's, that's the, the, the effect of what, you know, losing control is all about. We don't want to lose control. 
fact, we want the opposite. You know, if you have pre-emergency of uh, readiness effect, the chaotic curve that kind of leads to the losses, the injuries, and potentially the death, you know, it, it drops down to nothing because you got a plan IC in charge, a lead operator's got their gear on, and a notification unit leader that makes the calls, an evacuation group supervisor who does not let those people walk out into that vapor. They put them into safe refuge. They monitor what the conditions are. They might even leave them there in safe refuge or move them when, it's time, when the timing is right. He coordinates that. And he has a safe refuge manager who is taking names, keeping people calm, addressing all their concerns, and communicating back to that evacuation group supervisor who is mindful of all the zones, the hot zone, the isolation zone, controls the access, is the leader that keeps people out of harm's way. That's that that person's job. The lead operator, what's he doing? The lead operator is focused on what? Putting Sal to bed, right? Putting Sal to sleep, moving him into the, into the brig. You know, everything we talked about earlier, he's trained, he's ready to actually solve the problem. And the plan I see is calling the shots. The plan I see, what they need to do right off the bat, they get the call first, they can engage first, what we want them to do is, number one, define the hazard zone. Is it a cold room? Is it the engine room? Is it the loading dock? What's the zone? And we have a plan for each of those hazard zones. And then what's my level of concern? Level one, level two, level three. It tells us a lot. And, and then, it, then he sets where his command post is going to be, where he's going to be located, and where he wants his command team to meet him. Now, his, his notification unit leader, his evacuation supervisor and his lead operator of all pre, they have prescribed game plan that they go to. When he says the engine room level two, the hazard zone checklist for those automatically tells those positions what they need to start doing without having to get direct orders from that plan I see. That's what the hazard zone checklist, one page just gives it to them. They start that action plan while the plan I see is beginning to work on the life safety concerns. Where, what do we got when the lead operator community, what do we got in the, in the IDLH and in the isolation zone, which is how many feet? How, small release, large release, 500. So 100 to 500, right? What's going on in that area? And I'm taking care of it. It's my number one priority. And I got my lead operator putting Sal down. Does it feel like a plan starting to happen? that's engaged, that's prescribed, that it's, it's laid out, it's written and trained on. You know, that's what these guys need to do, or these people, the operators, the, the planners, the command team members, that's what they need to do to stay on top of that first 30 minutes. Now, one, the number one priority that, that we put in our, in our game plan when we work uh, with this whole logic is, you know, there's questions that come up with, should I or shouldn't I engage on certain problems? Where do I draw the line? And we gave the general parameter is number one, across the board, your life safety is always number one. Never do anything that jeopardizes your life safety. I mean, you saw with a clip of the chaos, the operator, hands and, and face burn. That's, that's failure. Your life safety is always number one. And then the, the awareness of the hazards and the engagement of the team. Get that command team working together. That's number two. Get that process going. Understand where the problem is, what's going on, and then get the team moving on that aspect. Level one, two, three, where's the hazard zone? What's the action plan? Practice that. And then um, you can protect others. Strategically, if those few people can engage in that, you can protect everybody. Strategically, you're much better off. This one plan process, I've been working on this with Don, and, and uh, actually we, we work with EPA. We've been to Washington several times. Been, the one plan concept's been around for a long time. It's four phases of response, discovery, initial response, sustained response, and then terminating the emergency. It's simple. It seems logical, seems easy. But when you go back operationally and you take that planning concept and you try to apply it at the field level, it gets hard. <laughs> Believe me, it gets hard. How do we get the checklist and the methodology organized so that it's very simple and it's starting and then it develops into more complex 
as the incident grows to initial response and then the sustained response. How do we get this phase so we're doing the right things in the first steps and then growing our command team, our ICS logic, integrating with the fire department and then being able to manage the bigger scenarios. That was our, our challenge and we're just now getting it. And, and we did it w w locally here with Brea, the Brea Miracle. That's, that's going to be our starship facility with regards to their capabilities. And it's working. But it's just like oh, Oliver Wendell Holmes said. He said, I'd give, I would give nothing for a simple, a simple solution on this side of complex. In other words, if you don't understand the complex, how can you build a simple, logical plan? He said, but I'd give my right arm for simple on the other side of complex. Because after you understand the big picture and all the complexities, and then you boil it back down to simple, now you've got a plan that's leading someplace, right? And that's what this process is all about. We, we, we figured it out up here, but we need to bring it back down and phase it forward. And, and, and put it together in a way that, that the command team can use it. So the Brea One plan, just to kind of bring it into focus, we, you know, we have a, a concept here that starts with, you know, the discovery phase. And what we're doing is, is in the discovery phase. And again, this is this is part of what we downloaded for you, and you can look at it with with detail later. But we, in the discovery phase, we figured, you know, we've been working for so long on on the higher end stuff, like how to engage the the, the command team on the hazmat team to go in and isolate components and how do you operate valves and how that fits into you know, the, the, the control of a situation that's out of control on a big, big release. And we forgot all about really working where, where the rubber really meets the road is in the early phases of the response to discovery phase. How much time is lost, valuable time is lost, trying to get the message from the person who delivers it to the plan I see who will engage a plan that starts the ball rolling with regards to acting on it. You know, it's, it's, it's like driving. You know, if your reaction time is good and your distance is good, you can steer out of harm's way pretty easily, right? Especially if you're a good driver and you've been trained and you work that way. Race car drivers are a good example. I mean, they're always looking way ahead. They, they know between where they're at and what's going on. If they're in a slide, they're not looking at where they're going to hit. They're looking at where they're going to steer out of it and where they're going next. So they know their systems. They know how to do it. And it all starts with discovery. How do I get that transitioned and in place and get the ball rolling so that my command team, these key players, start acting on their checklist? And we have checklists for every position, one-page checklist. A good book out there called Checklist Manifesto. It sells the story on checklists, the value check. Doctors use them. Engineers use them. You know, the, 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 the people in finance use them. And when they use them, they, they don't miss those key points. And they act in the progression of where they should be, what they should be doing as they go through the process. It was fun. One, one funny little element is doctors have got, you know, they're trained for umpteen years and spent tons of time on their technical expertise and they're a little bit put off sometimes, maybe it's an ego thing or whatever, but about having to follow a checklist. It's kind of a little bit maybe beneath them, and so they wouldn't do it. And so they kept missing things, simple things like sterilization, sometimes even simple things like the right, you know, right or left leg, which one is the one we're working on today. So they did something smart, and they put the head nurse in charge of the tech checklist. Nothing happens unless the head nurse goes through the process and reminds everybody of what those steps are. And that person watches it, and they saw the rates of loss, death, injury significantly drop following the checklist. Ask a good pilot what they operate under when they do all their operations, emergency and otherwise, checklist. So we work on that, checklist driven. Then it gets into the initial response phase. How do we, you know, contain and control? That's where we, you know, initiated the game plan by, by defining it, and then we start the process of, of defining the hazards and acting on them in the initial response. Then when we get to sustained response, we have a plans section chief that has been brought into the picture by now, who will be then looking more of the technical ins and outs, the PNIDs, you know, and, and the SOPs, 
and the specifics of what we wanted to do to engage on the specific problem we're up against. Um, and then, of course, all important phase, terminating the emergency and then going to recovery. Uh, that's still a very a dangerous period of time, but technically signing off on the incident and then going into recovery. Um, I'm going to skip through the process a little bit and show a little bit on the way we've, in, uh, we've engaged this. Um, the, the importance of defining our zones, I want to get it up back up here real quick. Um, the, the process starts with, with life safety alert, notify, and command control, and escape. We defined four zones in, in the cold storage facility that we worked on. The motor room where the high pressure receiver is, the condenser, the, um, um, and, and it's actually where the mechanical room is. I'll get that up bigger, I guess. It's not going to do it. Um, and then we take and go through that process of defining the zones with a floor plan. So in this facility, you can see our motor room is number one. It's located down over in this side. The cold, the cold, the loading dock that actually has refrigeration is right here. And then there are cold rooms. There's, there's actually three individual rooms that have doorways in between. Um, and uh, so we define that as well as the safe refuge location. This darn thing um, is it's in that yellow area right here and an emergency exit out of that. Now you'll see in, in, the, in the, the diagram below here that we have um, a picture of what that diagram is all about. There's the, there's the engine room and there's the 100 foot circle. That's for the small release. You notice that the 100 foot circle actually comes right into a, a facility called the penny saver. And we said, whoa, they're, they're concerned. They're real close. They're right next to the engine room. If something goes down, we need to get to them quickly with you know, notification that there's a problem going on with the ammonia so that they can react. So in our hazard zone checklist, when do you think we make that notification? Level one, level two, or level three? On a, on a small release, a contained but controlled release, or a large release? We, we decided to go with level one. We're going to tell them right off the bat that if, even if we have a small incidental release so that they can engage their own plan. And, and we've worked with them ahead of time with what they would do to ca actually deal with that. Now, uh, if we have a, a, you know, we also have defined, predefined where the instant command post would be. Uh, we have, this is the interest off of orbiter. If it's a small release, we, we can, we'll set up right at the entrance. If it's a larger release, we're down here by Kramer. And we work with the fire department on that. Yes? How did you define small? Small is a 150 pound cylinder, uh, and large is, is, is multiple 50, you know, sizes. That, but it's the tank, it's the receiver. It's <laughs> catastrophic, there's one more category. If it's catastrophic, the entire system, like when that condenser blew up, and it dumped all the ammonia all at once, then the 1,000-foot rule would kick in. So it's 100, 500, and if it's catastrophic, it's 1,000, you know, and that, but that's very unusual. But in that zone, in fact, this 200-gallon this release, the cloud went 568 feet, Don? 568 feet when that condenser blew was where the cloud went. And then it was gone, went, went, went on up to atmosphere. We also have, you can see the other, um, there, there are other people in the isolation zone, other facilities in the isolation zone. The zone itself is all centered around where the mechanical room is because a release in the cold room would be contained. The release in the cold room would be vented when, when we do uh, positive pressure ventilation and get rid of the vapor with a plan for the downwind. The prevailing wind, we did a ro wind rose down here. You can see the, the, the diagram for that right here. And you can see the prevailing wind is, is, is coming from the south, come, going across. So this is, this is the area that will, will get the hit the hardest in the first phases of the release. Um, and, um, 
and if it's coming from here, the, our safe refuge location is right here in the, in, the, in the lunchroom. So we're actually even on the, we're looking at it now, even the air intake for their HVAC system is, is probably going to be pretty safe if that release is blowing away from them. So the evacuation group supervisor and the safe refuge manager, that's their job, to secure the safe refuge location and to control the HVAC and to make sure they know what's going on in, in that process. We go on now to uh, the catastrophic circle, and you can see we take in a few other players here, and, um, and we've already designated those, and EPA says that, and, and it's in your risk management plan, that you should define where those locations are, that you should prepare them in, in, in letting them know that ammonia is, avail uh, is in the area and that there could be a need for it, but it's their responsibility to develop their own plans. And it's the fire department and the industry together that, are, that, that need to work on that receptor management logic about what do you do when you get on the scene and the ammonia is moving in a dangerous level to those areas where we have problems. And that's where we're kind of dropping the ball. We got the risk management plan information. You know, we've got the information about our own facility, but how do we connect to those receptors so they're ready? Because EPA is kind of saying, you own the ammonia. Somebody gets hurt, you know, in that isolation zone or in that area defined and you know, are aware of that is a higher risk. It's still, you still own some responsibility there. Now, the level and degree of liability is not necessarily a regulatory fine. It's a liability issue. Kind of comes back to what happened. How well prepared? What did you do? to define those locations, work with the fire department, get that information out, and with your local COOPAs, because that's your job too, right? You're looking after life safety for the people. You, many of you have PPE, many of you have the talents and the skills to really work with those receptors while the emergency is occurring. Now, we do a good job on that. Our liability goes down, and our responsibility for getting the job done is accomplished. And that's what the process of the one plan really brings out. Is, is, you know, basically how that goes forward. Um, moving down, we get into then the protective action zones and the, and the you know, the 1.3 mile uh, area and the, and the receptors that are located there. You, you know that, you've seen those maps. We define the sides of the building. You know, this is really good when you're working with, with public safety responders, but we, we got, you know, the sides of the building, right? And you, on your command side, where your command post is set up, you're looking straight ahead, that's side A. That's instant command system, right? And then side B, you go clockwise. Side B, side C, side D. So if you're working over in corner CD, you know that that's where the emergency exit is from the safe refuge. It's sitting over on that corner. And firefighters and responders in the facility you can all talk the same language. You don't have to go, I think it's northeast or south, southwest or whatever. It's corner CD. We visualize it, we plan it. With, with Ernest and the team, they're even gonna paint it on, the, on their walls, side A, side B, side, just so their team gets used to, you know, geographically orienting, orienting themselves in a good way. They have a lot of concern for side B, because side B, that's where the penny saver is, and that's, that's where there's gonna be a lot of action. And so we got pictures of it, and we're ready to engage uh, our, our action plan. Now, the, um, as we go through this, we have the, 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 the way that the roles of the players are in a, in a checklist format, how they're engaged. I don't really have time right now to go through all that. I do want to take you through the process. We, we have, a, oh, what the heck? There we go. We have an emergency call-in form and a training that goes with that. We want the who, what, where of what's going on, those details. And, and then to transfer that who, what, where, and what's going on, what's the life safety threats, immediately to the incident commander. And that who, what, where is triggered to hazard zones. What's going on? What kind of release do we have? Opportunities so that the nature of the problem, the hazard zone and the level of concern, and the size of the isolation val uh, uh, zone can be defined fairly quickly by the incident commander. So when the incident commander takes charge, uh, they announce that right off the bat. 
and we have a, a method for tracking who's, who's available. The plant IC, the lead responder, notification unit, evacuate, who's available and scheduled for the week, the month, whatever the period, planning period they want to use, so they know they've, they're backed up always by uh, somebody that's there and available to take that position. The checklist also allows for, in, in some cases, like the notification unit leader, the plant section chief, they don't even have to be there. When they log the information, the scribe, the person making the calls, you know, records it. It's documented. We need that, and we need to track with it the documentation throughout this, this process. And then um, when, we, when we go through, and actually I'm going to get down to the hazard zone checklist here. Notification lists. Um, another element to the process is uh, we have a situation status form that, that we track. We have uh, off-site, you know, the contractors, the toxicologists, those that can support the response are the, the phone numbers and, and information is readily available. Right on through now to when we get into command control and public safety size up, uh, we, we have a checklist that kind of you know, gives them the good information, and, and then we get into the, you know, the actual decision about, you know, what, what we have uh, defined earlier in the process through our teaming agreement uh, that they will actually do. You know, that we've already trained and we develop protocols for rapid entry rescue. You know, and, and right now, a lot of fire departments are reluctant to get in with turnouts on anything to do with any chemical. That's a taboo until they know for sure that they can safely engage with that level of PPE, they're not going to do it. Now, once uh, on the other side of this coin, once they are trained and prepared, they'll go further. And that's the part of the process, is to define what level of effort will we have in, in, in helping and engaging during uh, rapid injury rescue and downwind receptor management that we've talked that through, we planned it, we know how we're going to cooperate and work together. Medical support, um, support during defensive simple, meaning when we're going in and, and, to, and to calm Salmonia down, that firefighters will back up people working outside of the IDLH, but they'll back them up just in case something goes wrong and that we work together. Now, all this list, of, you know, as fire chief in Watsonville and now working a lot with the Monterey Bay Area of, of fire agencies, as well as over in the valley and across the country, as, as fire service gets more and more tuned as to what the level of threat is versus what the opportunities for, for saving and, and actually doing good things, that's what they weigh out with knowledge and preparedness so that we can engage. So that's the process that we're going through in, in preparing the, this whole pro, uh, methodology so that we go together and address it smoothly. And then we get to the hazard zone checklist. This is the... This is one of the key parts of the process that, that I said earlier is kind of a way of prescribing our action plan. If we have, uh, if we've been notified, and this is some, oh boy, this is, this is really a challenge here. Jumped on me. So let's say we have an incident that um, is, is, it's in the, um, it's in the machine room. Uh, in Brea, they call it the motor room. And, uh, and so we have developed, a, for the motor room, we have developed an understanding of what the hazards, risks, and threats are in a summary fashion. How much ammonia is located there? They also got some of the acetylene. Uh, what, the, uh, what the immediate life safety concerns are, you see the penny saver up there. There's also the battery charging room, the loading dock area. And then what's our threats? Flash fighter in the motor room, as well as high pressure aerosol release. That's the kind of things that could happen there, right? So what do we do to prepare for that? Well, on a, a level one, the isolation zone that we defined is 100 to 300 feet based on what kind of a release it's going, that, that it can materialize. It's up to the incident commander to call it. 100 to 300, no bigger than 300. And in that situation, a notification unit leader is pre-authorized to call the uh, contractor 
And Embraer, um, you know, when, when we set this up, they have technicians that, are, uh, that work at Americold plants in Anaheim and in Vernon and the city of industry. So when they have a level one, they call two of those techs automatically and their contractor. Why? Because in Brea, they're right in a pretty heavily populated area. They aren't going to let time go by. They're going to bring those players in early just in case that domino effect starts that we know often occurs with small releases. They get them rolling with all their gear, and they can pick up their gear and be in the pickup, and there, within the first 15, 20, 30 minutes, they can be on site to support what, whatever the action plan is. The, the plant IC gives approval for notifying the receptors uh, their regional corporate, the fire department, and the backup re for um, for backup that is, and regulators. The the uh, control is pre-emergency readiness, the clipboard that we talked about, and the evacuation group supervisor is put on standby, and they're going to evaluate wind direction, eye level wind in direction, not not the wind sock, but what's going on at eye level, where the wind is rolling around, and where they're going to move people and what the conditions are. They're going to look at that. They don't have to engage it, but at a level one, they're going to look at it and prepare for it. The notification unit leader is going to listen and document. And if they're engaged, they're going to make the calls, right? Level two, it jumps up. And, and the process gets even um, more engaging to where they actually start then uh, calling more resources. 911 on a level two is an automatic pre-authorized call. So if the, the commander says it's a level two in the motor room, they, the notification unit doesn't even have to ask. The regulators in 911 get automatically called. They set it up in their game plan. And it just progressively gets more aggressive, right? Pre-authorize and set up the actions based on the kinds of releases. So that action plan, it's just like watching a football game. That action plan is already mapped out. They got the first 15 or 20 plays ready to go. And it's just a matter of putting that plan into effect when, when, uh, when, when the whistle starts the game. Now the next important part of this, at the back side of this, of this forum, uh, we have um, what the lead operator is going to be doing. Now, and the lead operator is the guy that's really getting in next to the hot zone, right? So as we said earlier, number one, the fire, the hazard, fire hazard control and ability to, to deal with fire threat is right at the top of the list. We have the information av available to do that. But underneath that, and I'm, I'm sorry for the small print, but you do have a copy of this. You can look at it yourself. There, there's issues that, that start with controlling sources of ignition. The number one concern when you're looking at any, uh, doing a hazard analysis with any ammonia leak is how much ammonia is, is really getting out here. Now, if there's a cloud of ammonia building in the engine room and we're not staying ahead of it with our exhaust system and it's getting, you know, past that, what's the, what's the magic number that we're concerned about? Parts per million for reading higher than what? 8% is 80,000, one quarter of that, 20,000. So at 20,000, it's there. We're, you know, if we're passing that or a cloud is getting big, then that lead operator is, is going to start shutting things down because he doesn't want it to ignite. But if he's using his ventilation system and he's pumping it down, Don, is that, you know, can we stay ahead of that in a lot of our releases? We can actually steer it out of harm's way, right? Just like the race car driver. If we're looking ahead and jumping on that quick enough, we can keep that level down. Now do we have to shut everything down? Actually, it's working for us, right? What I would like to see happen in emergency response and what we're building in the Brea plan is that lead operator, you leave him figure out exactly that. He has a team of people. They decide what they're going to do and how they're going to do it, and they control that problem based on, on their hazard checklist and the options they have available. They can pump it down, put, put Sal in the brig, they can drop his pressure, they can use their emergency pressure relief devices, ventilate the vapor with a downwind plan. They work exclusively on the operational function of, of that system within the level PPE and the SOPs that they work. And on top of that, 
we have a pre-authorized callback of a plans section chief who is going to help figure out how to handle that, lease, that release and work back to the incident commander on the options that we can do to bring that system under control. You hit it hard, you hit it big, you hit it with a plan, right? Now, fire guys, you know that. We do that all the time. And we got to teach that same principle, you know, to the, uh, to the refrigeration industry and anybody else. This one plan is all hazards. So it, it, the concepts work for any kind of a chemical, fire, bomb threat, any kind of an emergency event. You, you set it up with the same kind of command team and you use checklists, responsibilities to kind of take it through its process. And voila, we come back down and we start controlling it. And we bring it back to safety. And that, then we go into termination and we go into recovery and we do our safeties and, and we don't lose you know, uh, the losses that we're seeing it happening. So I'm gonna end the, I'm running out of time here. I'm gonna end with, uh, with one video of the, the uh, something we created here with regards to kind of a visualization of how it could go on an incident. We're gonna be doing this, uh, actually we've been received funding to do this, uh, uh, a video that we'll have available in six months that we can show the, you know, the one plan in operation. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna cut the sound because I'm gonna tell you what, 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 what's going on here. So day-to-day -day operations, right? Trucks are coming and going. Truck driver's waiting for his load. He fell asleep at the, you know, while he was waiting. They'll, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll call him in when it's time. Um, business is kind of moving along. Um, the, the clerk at the window is doing her work, answering phones. The uh, plant engineer is working on his plans. The, the, the operations in the cold room. You, know, you see the evaporator coil up there in the loading dock? That had ammonia in it. All of a sudden, the truck driver comes out, he's got a terrible odor of ammonia, and it's coming out of where the motor room is. So he goes in and he, and he reports it. Now this is where a lot of times, sometimes the chaos picks up, is this young lady has got to be prepared to ask what? Who, what, wh where, how big, what's the life hazard? Try to get a big scope on, a scope on what the issue is, and she's got a form and even a poster right there that she plays off of. Try to get some information from there. And then, as soon as that's done, she's going to take that information and she's going to call her plant IC. There he is. Do you recognize that handsome devil? <laughs> now, now, when Ernest got that call, he, he, wanted, he figured out that he had a problem in the motor room, that the smell and the, and the ammonia was all the way out in the loading dock, and, um, and that so from the standpoint of his decision making when he engages command team, he's got hazard zone being the motor room, level of concern, three. He doesn't know for sure yet, but at this point, because it's spreading and he's right next to that penny saver, he knows he's got, you know, this guy, the way he reported it, the information came in, two or it's not contained. It's a three. It's out. It's getting away. Level three. So what happens? The notification unit leader gets this message. It's, you know, the isolation zone will be, you know, potentially up to 500 feet, for 300 to 500 feet. He's going out to look at that right now. He'll assign the, the isolation. He's going to the command post, and so he'll be going out to orbiter, and then if that's not good, he'll fade back to... Kramer, right? That's where he's going to meet the fire department. The lead operator already got a notification on the ammonia monitor that went off. So they're suiting up to go check out the problem. And the evacuation group supervisor is going to start the process of engaging the, the movement of people, including the truck drivers and the visitors and everybody outside it. So the team is pre-authorized. All they got to know is where's the problem, what's the level of concern, and what their checklist responsibility is. Start it basically simple, but engaging. As we go forward, Ernest gets outside. He can look across. The lead operator and his partner are, are checking it out. They're getting their gear on. They're talking about their emergency uh, action plan. 
uh, that goes inside with a monitor and an APR is reading the level of ammonia, getting closer to the receiver. As he gets there, he's picking up 100 parts per million. He's outside the hot zone, but he sees what's going on and reports that back to the incident commander so that the life safety objective be can be established, that we have secured the, the isolation zone and the hot zone. When he reported, there's nobody there, we've secured that isolation zone, all we got is what? The truck driver asleep in the, in the truck there in the loading dock, right? We know that's there. Does the incident commander have to go get that guy out? Who gets that guy out? Exactly. The evacuation group supervisor is in charge of that. And the safe refuge manager is taking care of him on the other side. And he may just give word to that truck driver, get out, move, you know, your truck and move on out of the hot zone. Or he may move him out of the truck and get him to the safe refuge area, depending on what the conditions are. Now we're off to see what we can do to control this release. And we went through this scenario, we learned a few things, and this is why hands-on training is so good. Watch him when he takes, he's bringing his fan there, he's got his uh, portable fan, kind of stumbled a little bit. Now look at him when he turned it around and went that direction. Much better, right? When it was right out in front of him. There's our emergency pressure control. We can dump the pressure off that system with this control box, high and low side. We could start to put Sal asleep. Meanwhile, what the idea was is to get this fan going and see if we could get in there and get that. There, he saw the leak. He's going to try to put a tarp over it and contain it while staying under 300 parts per million because all he's got is an APR. He's got his buddy that's backing him up. The commander knows what's going on and is checking his checklist. He's got isolation, the, the, the life safety issues taken care of, containment and control is in place. As he moves forward, the, 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 he's now set up his command post and he's able to kind of start doing some advanced planning with his plan section chief. The decon corridor has been set up for, for logistics, you know, in case somebody needs a fast decon. And the ammonia shut down, the video shut down on me. What, what you would have seen, if that would have worked all the way through, is they, that when he went in with that fan, blew the vapor away, put a tarp over a leaking valve, and he was able to shut it off and isolate it. And then vent it, and the problem was over. Mainly because they were prepared. They train on their checklist. They train on the hazards, risks, and threats, but then they bring it back down to what are we going to do to engage action to stop the problems when they're small. And my video went off because I hit my mark on the time. It's now 4.30. So. <laughs> and so I can, uh, I can answer a few more questions, but I, but I, I, I took them all up. Any, any questions real quick? Don. acted like that was our problem and uh, you know they would like somebody to tell them what to do and, and, and someone to do it for them but you know our corporate philosophy we can't do that and so we're working through uh, ASTI for example uh, to help with that communication to them because they need to develop uh, develop their own plan uh, and a corporation won't develop that plan for them uh, but consultants and third parties like uh, ASTI will do that and we're also working with the Abrea Fire Department in order to help with that communication. And they seem to be on board uh, with ASTI doing some of that first communication notification that they need to develop a plan. And then, of course, ASTI can, can give them information on, on how to develop that plan or help them develop that plan. But uh, for the most part, for uh, where they're located, the uh, uh, Refuge in place is probably going to be their best uh, alternative, uh, unless it's something that uh, uh, really gets out of control and, and either sh even shelter in place may not be appropriate. Um, but uh, uh, they have some reluctance to deal directly with us, and our legal staff have some, uh, some reluctance to go in and try and help them develop anything. So 
I think in this case, uh, ASTE and the fire department are going to be the appropriate resources in order to help sort of circle the wagons on, on uh, uh, the penny saver in order for them to develop a plan and know exactly what to do when we may, uh, if at some time we make that call. You know, that we're having a ammonia, ammonia release, you need to activate your plan. I don't know, Lee, do you have any ideas about how to uh, uh, enhance that? Uh, th what he described, but we're seeing that's happening a lot, is the companies in the isolation zone, number one is how do you break this news to them that there's ammonia down the street and not have them go kind of off the wall about that. But then secondly, they, they tend to do like Ernest says, they, they, they want you to do something about it, you know, and, and to do something about it is just for them to simply understand how to do shelter in place. But have you found a way to... To smooth the path? How about a Koopa, a Koopa leader? Uh, and, and from the from the local you got any yeah. And so what, when we, so. And now the old vet will tell us from her experiences and the many things that she does. Yes. So, Baronia, you will actually go yourself as well to help that process, or you're saying that they, they would need it? You would do that? Uh, yeah. and, that food and is that what you were saying as well? Thank you. Maybe that's one of the angles that we have not used well enough is, is actually work with the local environmental folks to help us get that message out as a you know, preemptive effort and engaging their readiness. Because we got information, we got programs, we got a lot of you know, opportunity, but when, when it kind of is a little bit dip, more difficult as I've been working closer with, with corporate entities for them to go into another corporate entity to try to tell them what they should or shouldn't do. Especially when we got capable leaders that, that, that really probably should always be in the lead on making those kinds of decisions in the first place. So if we supported you with the information and then you facilitated getting it to them, from the planning perspective, that would, you know, that would initiate the process. And then from an emergency perspective, you're called out. And this is one of the things that I you know, really try to stress when we do our training is, don't look at the regulators during an emergency response uh, challenge as the as much on the enforcement side as the responder side. They're going to actually help you, you know, bring control to the scene so nobody gets hurt. That's your primary objective. Then you figure out the rest of the story that you would figure out anyhow after that if there were problems or issues to take care of. But during the emergency response, you're part of the team, and that's that's one of the receptor issues are probably one of your biggest besides the environmental issues one of your biggest concerns, right? That's what they want to see you do.
And what do they say? Ernest has a trifold that they've created uh, that uh, about ammonia and their plan. They, uh, they, and they make it specific of mar Maricold, but if somebody wants it, which they kind of want you to have it, but you know, it's, you, you know, not forcing it on you, then you at least have something to go by as a pattern. How do you shelter in place and what's ammonia about? A little bit about the agle and the issues about exposure, kind of a, kind of a you know, unfold three, there it is, both, you know, a lot of information. That might help. Yeah. What about having a good neighbor fund that is um, generated by the businesses where neighboring businesses could get a grant to prepare an action plan to, to respond to this, where the money would be paid back? But I think not only telling the neighbor you need to do something, but saying, and here's where you can get some low cost funding to do that. You know, there's a. a a FEMA grant that's actually right here in Southern California that, that just came out about six months ago. We, we actually put in for it to do exactly that. Create materials that could be given out that, that local COOPAs, fire agencies, p individual industries can give out and, and have available to, do, to accomplish that. So that, that could feed into that. They haven't get awarded those grants yet, but uh, hopefully we get it and we'll be able to bring that back. Yes, sir. So their strategy has been to invest in mitigation. Everything they can do to bring these problems under control before they get away, that's their first step. Aggressive on that side. Otherwise, they'd have to close shop and move. Yes. Shelter in place. <laughs> <laughs> like in some places, they say that because if you've got a lot of residents or schools or something in the UK is there first, and they have the right and the, I don't know how local agencies or fire department actually can deal with them, and they can fight against you basically to take you out of that business. Is that true? Well, lawsuits can happen, but they have to have cause, right? Yeah, and it's awfully tough to do because I know over in Taurus, there's there's refineries, you know, and, and communities and neighborhoods very close to those. And I think the refinery was in first, but the neighbor, you know, the community, cheaper land, you know, they still developed up around it, and they haven't been able to force those refineries to close down. If you look at, uh, I'd say, just a rough estimate, and correct me if you think I'm wrong, but, but I'd say at least half of the industrial cold storage facilities are in uh, urban areas close to life hazards. Some of them straight across the street from hotels, motels, down the street from schools, you know, those kinds of things. And in my history, my, my time of looking at every ammonia release that I could ever find over the last 25, 30 years, I've yet to find any serious injuries that have occurred in the protective action zone. It's all in that uh, isolation zone. That, that, that's the part that I'm most concerned about. And so, you, not to say that they don't smell it, it doesn't scare it, scare people, it doesn't cause them nausea, and they, you know, and, you know, because stress does that. But, but the protective action zone, downwind stuff, is usually so easy to get away from. Just stay in the house. I mean, we had in Minot, area, uh, Minot North Dakota or South Dakota, it, the nine rail cars, a million pounds of ammonia on a cold, wintry day where the ammonia just slowly moved through a town of 30,000 people. One death. And it was because the guy decided to get in his pickup and drive out his garage and try to drive out of that cloud. And he, and he found out he couldn't do it, and then he tried to get back in. And his truck, I don't know, did it crash or something? And he got out of it, and he died trying to get back in his house, I think. 
Otherwise, that million pounds of ammonia went through the community and it's gone. One thing they learned about that, and I know you guys got to go, but one thing they learned is turn on the showers or a wet washcloth. Salmonia loves water and it goes there first. And it, they found in a bathroom with the shower going that the ammonia went right into the water and down the drain. And, uh, and they dropped the levels from close to 1,000 parts per million to, to like 25 to 50. Uh, remarkable results almost immediately. That ammonia rushing for the water. And the wet washcloth, initially, that will gather up and the moisture, when it saturates, you rinse it out or you get another one and, and, it, and it works as an emergency you know, precaution. So other angles. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. It's been a, a joy to be with you.